oxen. That's what his job was. He was the 12th guy in the set of 12 oxen. So he sat all day facing 24 oxen butts. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. That's kind of what he did. He just walked, and he, he was the last one. They say he was the boss, and that's what he did. And Elijah came about and said, come follow me. And, and Elisha at that moment said, you know what? I'm going to give everything I have, and I'm going to give it to Elijah, which in essence is giving it over to God because Elijah was a prophet. In the Old Testament, God worked and used and worked through the prophets. That's how he did things. And so Elisha was then dedicating his life to go after the Lord. And this is in 1 Kings 19. And so he, he takes and he kills his oxen and, and uh, burns his plow <laughs> with the oxen meat and has a big barbecue for everybody, cooks up a bunch of hamburgers and steaks and everything else. And he gives it all away to everybody there and he says, see you later, mom and dad, I'm leaving. And he never goes back home. And he goes and he, and he just goes and lives life with Elijah. Uh, and then we ended it and we talked about how in the Second Kings 2, Elijah goes to heaven, and he passes the mantle, he passes the torch back on to Elisha. And the whole point of it was saying, you know, if we give everything we have for the Lord, Elisha, following Elijah at that moment, had no idea what was going to take place. He's just going, okay, I'm going to put my trust in this guy Elijah that I know and I've heard a whole lot of stories about, but I've never met. So to him, he was just a complete stranger. Yes, he was an amazing man of God. He brought rain. He did all these things. But to Elisha, he's just... Okay, I'm going to trust in the Lord. That's something that I can't see, but I'm going to go after because I trust in God. And he got, uh, it says, a double portion kind of of his anointing. And the thought behind the double portion is, is one of a, it's kind of like an inheritance. And the firstborn kind of gets the full inheritance. And that's pretty much kind of what it's talking about. Is everything that Elijah had, Elisha got. And so that's kind of the, the mentality and the attitude behind all of that. So this week we're going to go, go you can go to 2 Kings chapter 3 with me, um, and we're going to kind of look at a story. But before we get to the story, we're going to, we're going to look at 2 Kings 2, where you don't have to really go there, but it's a couple of verses before it. It shows that Elijah's been up to some things. So Elijah goes up to heaven, leaves Elisha, and at this point Elisha's starting to set his tone, start, starting to set his precedent, his kind of repertoire, so to speak, of miracles. Um, and the first one he did is really cool. He, there's this, this river. So you take the Rush River, the Zumbro River, not really like the Mississippi, but just kind of like a creek or river that ran through a town. And in that day, you put all your cities, all your towns along the river so you could have fresh water and all the rest. This body of water, this stream, was poisonous. People would drink it. They either couldn't have kids or they die. Bummer. You know, and so pretty much if that city, if that town had any chance of living or surviving, that water needed to become clean again. And so Elisha says, hey, go get some salt. We're going to dump some salt. I'm going to pray for the scene. And God healed the water and the town survived. Awesome miracle. I got to bring it up because the next miracle is one of the funniest, maybe my favorite miracle of all time in the Bible. What happened is after this goes on, he goes. And a bunch of kids are making fun of him. And they're yelling at him. They're going, baldy, 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 baldy. They're, they're, they're calling him bald. And he gets ticked off, rebukes him, and G, rebukes him, curses him. And not only that, but he sends two bears out to maul them. And it says the bears mauled 42 of them. Because the bunch of kids are calling him bald. That's just hilarious. So all it says is, hey, you know, if you're a man of God... You better make sure teenagers ain't picking you from being bald. Just show any teenager that, and you'll scare them half to death. I don't know whether they're dead, they died or not, but it just says the bears mauled them. Well, that's just a bad day, but two bears eating 42 kids. It's a big dinner. And those, those are the two things at this point in time that Elisha is known for. And then a war breaks out in chapter 3 against the Moabites. And there's these three kings and the Moabites are going to try to come attack them. There's these three kings that say, hey, we got to team up against these guys. They're going to destroy us. And so they team up. They're not praying. They're not seeking God. They're not doing any of that. They just they take matters into their own hands, and they get themselves in a bunch of trouble. And the only thing they know how to do at this point in time is the only thing that they know how to do is we're in trouble. We better get a prophet. In modern day times, it's, oh no, we got ourselves in a whole lot of trouble. 
we better call the pastor. We better, what did I do? What did I get myself into? I better call somebody. I better hope that I get this thing figured out because I got myself in a whole lot of trouble. And we're going to pick up the story at the time to where these guys are now lost in the wilderness and they have been without water for seven days. They're, he, they're dying of dehydration. They have no water for themselves, their animals, nothing. And they are about to die of dehydration. That is how much of a need we are in. And one of the things we got to learn tonight, and hopefully we can learn, is that in the midst of sometimes our greatest need, if we let it, if we go after God, it can be some of our greatest blessing too. Because God loves to take really bad situations and turn them out for his glory and his honor. Because when situations are that bad, it's not a, it can't be fixed by man-made things. You know, when and a marriage is down that bad of a situation, it ain't going to get fixed by just, by man. It's got to get fixed by God. And it's the same situation. And this is, the, these men needed, they were on their deathbed. So let's go to 2 Kings 3, verse 10. And here they're going, we got to figure this out. We got to go after Elisha. We got to find a, we got to find a man of God. Here's what it says. Verse 9 says this, So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. See, told you. I wasn't lying to you. What, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to the Moabites? He's going, but what is God up to? He's going to kill us. Hello. But they forgot they didn't pray about any of this stuff either in the first place. And then Jehoshaphat said this in verse 11. But there, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Well, there's Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Well, he was kind of like Elijah's assistant. He got him water. He helped him out. He hung out with him. There's that guy. And I've kind of heard a story that I think he healed like this brook or this stream, this creek, this river that ran through the city. That was pretty cool. Then he did something that scared the junk out of everybody. He got mad at a bunch of kids and sent a bunch of bears after him. So I, there's got to be something to him. There's that guy. We can try him. And the other thought is this. is what Elijah was known for bringing water. And they were thirsty. So they're like, well, Elijah brought a ton of water one time. He brought rain when nobody else could bring rain. Maybe there's something with this guy. Maybe there's something with this guy. And they're sitting here just going, man, we got, we need help. We need help. And the only place we can turn to is Jesus. The only thing we can turn to is God. The only person we can turn to is a prophet because we don't have him. And they're seeking help because they have no place else to go. And so Elisha comes into this situation and is nice and calm and cool and collective. Not Exactly. See, here's Elisha, verse 13. So he goes to him and says, okay, you want to play games? Here we go. Verse 13 says this, Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do? What, what do we have to do with each other? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. He's like, what do you mean? What do you got to do? Go, why don't you go to all the ones of your parents? Wait a minute. You don't, you don't serve those anymore. You threw God down the drain. You don't, you don't have any of those anymore. He kind of, he played the mama card in the Old Testament. That's as close as you're going to get to, you know, slang talk in the Old Testament, I think. But it's there. It says, no, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three together to hand us over to Moab. The king is still in denial. And verse 14, Elisha says this, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, he wanted to make sure and point out, hold on guys, you're not serving the Lord. It's me. It's through my power. It's through me that God is going to fix this situation. It's not because of you. You're, you are not serving the Lord. He wanted to throw that dig in there. If I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not even look at you or even notice you. He's ticked. He's like, I don't care about any of you guys. 
But there's something about this king of Jehoshaphat, the king Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. There's something there that this guy had to serve the king, serve the Lord at some point in time that he had respect for him. He had respect for him. If it wasn't for me to respect him, I don't care about any of you. He was there for this one guy because he cared about him. They had some kind of relationship there with him. And then he says this to him, which is just kind of funny. Go get me a harpist. Go get me a harpist. If you ever think, feel bad about having to play like your favorite worship CD just to get in the mood to like pray, don't feel bad because that's what Elisha is doing. Elisha's like, hold on. I got to pray. Go get me a harpist. I need some mood music. I need something to set the tone. I need some time alone. I need it. Go get me a harpist. Think about this. So here they are. They haven't had water for seven days. They're dying. Elisha shows up and is like, um, you guys are a bunch of bumps. I don't care about any of you. I'm just here because I knew this guy before. And go get me a harpist. We're in the middle of a desert. We haven't had water for seven days. You need a harp? Uh, anybody got it? You know, it's just, it's one of those requests that you look at at the time and you need a harp. No big deal. Harp is a common instrument in the Old Testament. Cool, groovy. You read David. Oh, I've heard about it. But then you go to the big picture and you go, a harp in the middle of a desert? This is unbelievable request. So the, but they go get him a harp. And here is the key verse. And here's one of the things that's almost sad about this. Is when I study, when I, when I preach, and I walk through things, I take like six different translations of the Bible. And I kind of read through, read through them all in, in the thing to try to get an understanding of, okay, what is this passage trying to say? And one of the interesting things that even when we pull up in the new in the NIV that we have, like they download automatically into the computers, and the New Living Translation, they leave out a key sentence. So some of you, you might have it in your Bibles, and others might not in verse 16. Well, the rest of 15 says this. But while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So as he's praying, as he's seeking, God comes upon Elisha and goes, Here's what you're going to tell them. You, they want me to fix this situation. I'm, here's what you tell them. They're going to do what I say. So here's what the Lord tells Elisha to say in verse 16. And he said, This is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches ditches. See, it changes in the new one, and I don't like it, and I don't know why I'm not going to get into it, but it's just, I will fill this valley with pools of water. They missed the whole point. And this NIV, the new one, there's nothing we can do, but I wanted to, like, keep it with the, with the one that I had. I think this one was, like, back in, like, the 80s or something, the translation. But make this valley full of ditches compared to I'm going to do something paints a completely different picture. Because one translation of one version is saying, no, I want you to do something. And the other one comes in and completely leaves that and just says, God's going to just do it. But the, you, you're missing what God has called us to do in that translation. And I don't know why, but who cares? Let's just make sure we don't miss it. What he's saying they're telling them to do is something that's impossible. In their eyes, they're going, wait a minute, hold on, Lord. Elisha, are you sure? I mean, he's saying this to kings. They all have the power to kill him at any moment's notice, by the way, as well. That, well, then you want me to tell my guys when they haven't had any water to drink for seven days to get out all their shovels and start digging ditches all over the valley? Um, Elisha, you're nuts. They can barely stand. I mean, I know what I feel like when I've done like a week-long fast. And that's like juice and water and a couple cheating meals. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we've all been there. It's like, well, I made like two days. Let's, ooh, spaghetti and meatballs. Yeah, baby. <laughs> hey, it's Wednesday. I could cheat. You know, we've all had those. We were just exhausted. You're like, oh, they had nothing for seven days. They were dying. Their animals were dying. And Elisha goes, go dig some ditches. Huh? That is not what we want to hear. But PT's been preaching on faith. In order for these guys to have faith, they had to step out and do something. Right? James 4, 26. 
is very clear. It says, faith without works is dead. There's nothing we can do about that. I don't necessarily like that all the time. Well, can't I be lazy and still have faith? Jesus is like, "Uh uh-uh. Well, why, Jesus? I like being lazy once in a while. I can't do it. None of us can. We can't get around the scripture. We can't get around the story. We can't do it. But stepping out in faith takes courage. But here's the deal. We, in order to step out, in order to dig some ditches, we have to completely understand who's giving the orders. Who's giving the orders and who are we doing them for? These guys are in their deathbed. And or, they're going, okay, okay, you tell us to do what? Well, we're either going to die sitting here, not doing nothing, or at least if we dig some ditches, we might have a chance that this Elisha guy is actually a prophet like he says he is, and this God is real, and he's going to come through. Let's give it a shot. That can't be our attitude, but that had to be what these three armies together are thinking. That had to be what they're thinking. They're just normal people like us. But as Christians, if we are going to fully grasp all the things that God has called us to do, especially in times of need, now I'm not talking about like, dude, I need a new TV, my Xbox broke, right? Like I need an F-150, like not like a 1999 F-150, but like a 2017 F-150. I know they're not out yet, but you know what I mean? Like there's a difference of like, I need a sandwich and I need a new car. These guys are like, I need food. And when we need, and God says, no, I need to go and do something. It's important. It's vitally important. We have to make sure we know our place in Christ. And too many times we forget it, and it keeps us from stepping out, walking out in our faith. I shared these two examples a couple weeks ago, and Zimbrota has so much fun. I'm going to do it again. The first one is for all you ladies. Um, Guys, us men, we have a hard time grasping and figuring it out because the Bible talks about how we are the bride of Christ. Uh, it talks about it in Matthew. It talks about it in Revelation. It talks about it in a bunch of different places that we are considered the bride of Christ. And one of the amazing things that looking at the bride of Christ, they're like, oh, that's kind of nice and sweet. Oh, a bride. Yay, they're also happy on their wedding day and yada, yada, yada. But that's not the cool thing. That's not the important thing. Think about this on somebody's wedding day. On that wedding day when she's walking down the aisle, it makes no difference to her her groom what she's done. It makes no difference. She could walk down this aisle and have never even held hands with her spouse or another dude or anything. He doesn't care. He's just like, ah, my wife. Or she could have like the worst past ever imaginable He doesn't care. He's still seeing her as what? His perfect, spotless bride. And she's coming down, and all he can do is just, yeah, baby, that's my bride. Yeah. He gets excited. And that's the same way when Jesus looks at us, when he sees us coming, he's like, yeah, she's mine. That's why the Bible talks about how he's jealous for us. He's jealous. He wants us so badly because that's how he sees us, as perfect. He doesn't see our past. He doesn't see any of that. Once we're forgiven, it says the slate is wiped clean. It says it's as far as the east is from the west. That means they're gone. We remember everything. Jesus doesn't remember anything. All he sees us is as his bride, perfect and spotless. That's how he sees us. So that's why he's always going, that's why when it says faith without works is dead, because he's like, but don't you get it? Who you are in me? Why would you ever want to sit on that? Don't you understand the potential you have in me? And we talked about last week, the verse in John 14, 16, I think, where it talked about how we can do greater things than Jesus. If we really mean that, it has to come from who we are in Christ. We'll never grasp that verse. We'll never believe that we can do greater things than Christ or great things or ever or step out in faith and do anything if we think we're horrible. If we think God's like, oh, he's mad. No, God looks at us as perfect and spotless because we're his people. We're his chosen one. Now, guys, we have a really hard time as looking like a spotless bride, right? We can't figure out what it looks like to walk down an aisle in a white dress. That just ain't our cup of tea. That's why we've got to be thankful for a guy named Paul. Because he wrote a book called 2 Timothy. And in there, in that book, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 13, we won't really read it, 
But I want, it talks about how we are a soldier, talks about how we are an athlete, talks about how we, are, how we are a farmer for Christ. And, and it shows and it gives us an example of this is who we are. And I'm reading, I'm looking, I was like, you know what? How amazing, how awesome it is that I can be God's soldier. I can be his, and not just any soldier. I'm his special forces. I'm God's green berets. I'm his Navy SEAL. I am his chosen one that he has chosen for me. And not only that, I can call Jesus my commander-in-chief rather than any president. From the beginning of time through the end of time, Jesus is better than any of them. That's who we go to battle with. That's who we fight with. That's awesome. That means when God says, go and do something, even if we're on our deathbed, we're like, hey, I know who I'm doing battle with. I know who's done it. I know what I can do because of who's already done it. I know what he's done in the cross. I can step out with faith and do things when nobody else thinks it's possible because I have Jesus on my side. That's what it means. It's like, yeah, I can go into battle. I can go into something with the confidence that says, you know what? God has called me to do something. I can go and step out and do it. It takes faith. It takes work. It's not always easy. But I can do it because of my position in Jesus Christ. And the hardest part, and the, one of the things that we all have got to continue to learn is where we are. See, we look at a soldier and we go, okay, well, soldiers, there's like, you know, privates or just whatever, you know. And then there's like real soldiers, you know. And it's like, no, 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 no. See, there is no privates. There is no second class, first class. There is no ranking in God's army. We are all his special forces. We are all chosen by him to go to battle with him and for him. That's, that's what's awesome about it. We're, none of us are private first class. We just have to sit back and go, well, I better buy my time. I got to learn. Yada, 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 yada. It's like, no. Once your Jesus is, your Jesus is. It's not like he, Jesus is like, well, you haven't memorized Ecclesiastes yet. It ain't happening. You know? It isn't that way. He's saying, no, step out of faith and do something. I'll give you the strength to go after me. Are you willing to do it even on your deathbed, even when you're dying of starvation? But we've kind of sat back and said, oh, I don't know if I have the, I don't know if I can. And it goes back to really, truly not believing who we are in Christ. It goes back to saying, oh, I don't really know. I mean, we, God has given us all the tools and the abilities that we need to be successful and to live for him with everything we have, to follow the, what the Word of God says, to follow the Great Commission. When Jesus says, dude, through me all things are possible. You can do greater things than me because I'm going to the Father on your behalf. This can and will take place. He's given us the tools. How amazing is it that God told the people, hey, don't go down to stand Jerusalem. I'm going to clothe you with power from on high to go be my witnesses, to do the things I have. That's why the day of Pentecost is so important. That's why being filled with the Holy Spirit is, not, not, is so important. It's not that like before you had the Holy, like you were baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're like a private, and afterwards you're like some Navy SEAL. No! It's just that it's, God's wanting to give you more tools. He's wanting to give you more. He's like, ah, because he wants us, and he's jealous for us, and he wants us to step out in faith and do so many things. I mean, think about some of the stories in the Bible and some of the miracles that take place, and we can read them and all over the place, and you know them. I mean, think about Peter walked on the water. It wasn't just anybody. It was Peter. He took place in a miracle. God wants us to take place with him. He wants us to do things with him. He loves it. He told the lame man, what? He told the lame man to get up and actually walk. It wasn't just, oh, you're healing. Get up and walk away. He's like, no, watch this, man. You're going to experience this miracle with me. You're going to do this with me. You're going to see lives changed with me. I want you to be involved. I just don't want you to sit back and be stagnant. No, you get to do things with me through my power. That's awesome. It was the same thing back then. It's the same thing now. The miracles that we see take place, whether it's in the Old or the New Testament, all boil down to people acting out and walking out their faith. And then we see miracles take place. If Peter 
And he even says, it says, when Peter got distracted and he lost faith is when he started to sink. If he would have kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, kept his faith strong, he would have never sunk. It was when he lost his faith. That's why he sunk into the water. If we would never see miracles take place if people's faith wasn't there for it to happen, we would have missed it so many times. So many times. And there's so many different areas we can apply this to. There's so many different areas that we can apply this to. From, oh, from marriages to finances to relationships to whatever. I mean, you name it, you go, okay, if this is wrong, then step out in faith and act and do something. Right? If a part of your marriage is struggling, you go, okay, let's do something about that part. Maybe it's the whole thing. If there's a relationship with a loved one that's struggling, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to just sit back and wait for it. If a kid is struggling with something, you're going to go, okay, I can't help him, but hey, maybe Pastor Angel can. You're going to do something about it. If you're having what, you know, it's just, you're going to step out in faith because God's going to give you the ability to go out and do something. You're not going to sit back and just wait for it to get like a hundred times worse. You're going to act and do something because you know that God wants to fix it. God wants to put it back together again. He wants it. But digging ditches when there's no rain in sight or you want to do it. You see, it's hard. You see, it is hard. You're acting in faith. We're, we're acting in faith, and it's not easy. Because one of the things when you look at, they all dug ditches. Well, you had to start somewhere. The first thing they had to do, the kings had to finally go to the men and say, uh, guys, this is what this guy told us we got to do. I know you haven't had water for like seven days, but uh, we got to dig a bunch of ditches. Got to start somewhere. And then somebody had to stand up and say, hey, Stop whining. Stop crying. This is our only chance to survive. This is our only chance to live. This is our only chance to get back home to our families. We're doing it. It took one person to stand up, grab a shovel, and start doing it. And then what? Oh, if he's doing it, I'll do it. Okay, well, if those who are doing it, I'll do it. And it just, there's this momentum that sooner or later they had to do it. But they had to start somewhere. They had to start somewhere. And one of the things that we got to realize with faith, is that faith looks at a situation and goes, you know, this is what God can do, but I'm willing to do something that even doesn't seem that we can do. You're willing to start small. And that's one of the problems with, <laughs> I'll throw my generation under the bus, is that we look at so many things, and so many things are bigger now than they, what they were 50 years ago, from athlete salaries to, I mean, there's more mega churches now than there ever was in the history of America, to the politics to power to salary, whatever, you name it. Everything seems bigger, and everybody wants it more, faster, quicker, right away without putting, like, so much time and effort and, and work into it. And I'll just, I mean, that, that's my generation. I want to hand it to me on a silver platter. I don't want to work. I just, that's the majority of us. Well, I, I get it. But that's not what faith does. Faith says, okay, I, here's what God's calling me to do. Here's what I see. I want, I know God's calling me to have like the best marriage and to lead marriage small groups or to lead whatever, you know, dynamic marriage classes and all the rest. But I'm not there yet. So I know I've got one, two, and three issues in my marriage. So, but I know God's given me this big plan, this big thing of what I want. But in order to get there, I got to start somewhere. I can't fix every problem overnight but I can start working on one of them. You know, you, if, you know, you can do something. There's always that. There's always that. You can't retire when you're 30, but you can start somewhere. You can't just be a millionaire overnight. You can't just get out of debt overnight, but you can start by paying bills. Maybe if you can only, you know, you start somewhere, anywhere. Why? Because you're willing, to, you're willing to look at the big picture and dream big and see what God has for you, but you're willing to start small. You're willing to look at it and start small. You trust God for bigger and better, especially when it comes to His power, His presence in our lives, but you're still willing to start somewhere and to look at it small. 
And you see, and that's, the, that's part of this thing, too, is when we look at some of this, it's like, you know, we got to believe for God to do more in this city, in this community, in this area than we ever dreamed possible. Too many times we look at it and go, well, it'd be nice to hit this number. It'd be nice to do this. No, that's not God's plan. God's plan blows our plans out of the water. And it's, it's not about reaching a certain goal. It's about, okay, that God has this plan that we don't even know, that we can't even figure out. Because Isaiah talks about how his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are bigger than our ways, and all this other stuff. Okay, that's true. we got to go somewhere. we got to do something. I'm willing to just, you know what? I can do my part. I can't bring 3,000 people to church every week. But I can invite one. You know, you can, we can all do something. We can all step out in faith. We all can do something. We can step out in a faith in a big time way. You see, it's stepping out in faith is different than wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is saying, I really hope and I want something to take place, and you really, really want it to happen. But wishful thinking is just kind of sitting back and going, Well, I really want to have a successful marriage, but I'm not going to change anything I'm doing. That's wishful thinking, All right? I really, 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 really want my kids to serve the Lord, but I'm really tired, so we're not going to be super extra committed. Or I'm not going to take the time to explain to them why creation is so important. I'm just going to let the, everybody else explain it for them. I'm sure they'll get it in Sunday school, so they don't, whatever. Right, it's, I'm not willing to change what I'm doing. I just want the things around me to change. That's wishful thinking. Faith is looking at the same situation and going, I'm willing to take time to get it figured out. I'm willing to take, take time and effort to make sure that I'm going to do something about that. If I want something to change, I'm going to do something to make a change. These guys were on their deathbeds, and they were told to go dig a ditch. That's not easy. That's not fun. That's not a bunch of hoopla, rah, rah, yeah, baby, that's a good time. I can't wait to see what God has in store. That's just, I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I am in so much trouble that I can't get myself out of it, and I need Jesus. But shouldn't that be our attitude like 24-7? If the songs we sing in worship are true, that's true. That at the end of the day, no matter, we need Jesus 24-7 because he's the one that keeps our bodies together. Without his presence, without his grace and his mercy, we would just poof, cease to exist. Our entire world, the solar system, would just like explode. We need Jesus. How, how do we continue to do things? How do we continue to step out in faith? We dig a ditch one scoop at a time. Zechariah 4.10 says this, Do not despise small things, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. We must be faithful. See, we don't start anything big. You start with what you have. It's, uh, you know, it's, I, we lo- I love watching, uh, I don't love it. Tina likes watching The Biggest Loser. I just eat <laughs> during, <laughs> uh, but, uh, they're boring to me. I'm not going to lie. I don't like them. I watch them. She likes them. I'm trying to be a good husband. You know, watch a TV show she doesn't like. So she lets me watch football all fall and winter, right? Amen. So she loves watching them. The only thing that's kind of cool about them is that in the beginning, like the first workouts, they can't get through them. They're throwing up all over the place. And you're like, gross. I mean, that's all they do. It's just like workout, sweat, throw up, workout, sweat, throw up. You know, it's like that's just disgusting. But as I'm eating like a big bowl of ice cream and brownies and all the rest, it's great. <laughs> it shows. Um, so, but... It's cool then at the end of it, three months later, to look at the transformation. To go, oh, look, it. they started at one point, and they ended at another. And it's kind of cool to say, hey, they did something, but what? It started with one workout. It started with saying, I'm going to make a tape to try to get into some TV show that a million other people are going to try to get in there's no shot at. It started somewhere. Right? They dug a ditch. They took a scoop and said, I'm going to do something. I may not know what's going to happen at the end of this thing, 
but I'm willing to give it a shot. I'm willing to do something. I'm willing to dig a ditch. It was a valley of ditches. You know, you, we do things one small step at a time. You know, I, uh, I shared a little bit last week how, you know, I kind of, I got saved when I was saved, or saved, or rededicated my life on one of these two steps, and there was a big, big snot staying there for a couple weeks, and it got used as an illustration for a while, and I was like, okay, that's, that's groovy, and whatever, and now I'm the son-in-law, and yay, um, that's always fun. Dude, if you guys think your boss is bad, dude, my boss is my father-in-law, figure that one out, you know, so it's like, yay. He, he, well, he won't listen to this. We can make fun of him all we want. No big deal. <laughs> but one of the things that I did is at the time, I went through North Central. And anybody knows North Central? And Tina went to North Central. You get tons of student loans. And you walk out of there with like triple, quadruple-ish of like student loans and then what you make in a year. It's like, dude, those are some tough bills to pay. But... And, and I've learned my lesson the hard way because there's times where it's like, oh, I'll just forbear them. Oh, that's a deference? What's a deference? I don't know. Oh, I only got to pay 15 bucks a month? Sure. But you realize like you're paying like half the interest, you know? And you don't realize when you're 19 years old that you're just kind of pushing it back and pushing it back and making it worse and worse. Well, after a while, you realize and you're like, oh, man, I really shoot myself in the foot. And you got to kind of make a decision. All right, what I got to do? And you just start, okay, I got to at least pay the minimum. It'll take me 30 years, and I'll be 185 years old, but it'll at least get paid. I can't just keep pushing it off. I was the dummy that went to college, so I'm good, or whatever, you know, not, you go to college to get an education, but I was the dummy that didn't work enough in college to pay for it. I got to pay the price later on down the road. It's my fault. I can't blame anybody else for it, but you had to make a decision. Okay, what am I going to do? And you start making small steps and you start being faithful. And the first thing you got to do is you got to make sure that your tithe goes out first because if it doesn't, it's going to get spent every other way. Learn my lesson the hard way. But you start making decisions. I'm willing to do something. And now I look back and I mean, Tina just talking like a couple of weeks ago because she's actually going to have two of her three student loans paid off, which is like, that's amazing in like four months. It's like, oh, how cool is that be? But, and that's happened in like, oh, that's awesome. I, we never thought that would happen three, four, four years ago now. But it took one small step that says, we're going to stop passing the buck. We got to just start buckling down. We know what we got to do. We've done the Herzog routine. Now we just got to follow it. You know? <laughs> and we've the Herzogs knows what I'm talking about. You just got to stick it through and follow it. Let's do this. Let's dig our ditch. And we decided to do it. And then years later, down the, a couple years later, like, oh, we're actually starting to see progress. I didn't see any progress the first year, six months. It's like, this stinks. I mean, let's just be honest. It's like, oh, but what am I going to do about it? It's got to get done. I had to dig a ditch and realize, hey, if I ever want to get out of this mountain of debt that I put myself and nobody else did, I got to do something about it. If I ever want to get the marriage I want, if I ever want my kids to serve the Lord I want, if I ever want to do more than just sit around for Jesus and come to church, if I ever say, go, you know what, I actually want to accomplish something for Jesus. I read the Bible sometimes and I just sit back and go, I'm sick of reading about stories. I don't want them just to be stories. I want it to be like, guess what happened to me? Some kids started making fun of me not having any hair. And I said, you're in trouble because there's some cougars coming after you, you know? Hopefully I can, like, you know, I don't know, fix the Mississippi or something before that. But, ah, why? Because you just want God in you. That's our attitude. But it comes through faith. Are you willing to dig a ditch so God can answer the prayer? Because he did. He did. Second Kings 3. So I don't, Amanda, I think I forgot to put it up there, but it's okay. 2 Kings 3, 17 says this. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and your cattle and your animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. This is no big deal. You guys are crazy. 
you will, he will also hand over the Moabites to you. You will overthrow every fortified city in every major town. You will cut down every tree and all the rest. Then it says this in verse 20. The next morning about the time for offering the sacrifices, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. You see, when we go about and we dig some ditches, when we do the things that God has called us to do, and we live the way that he's called us to live, he provides and he comes through in ways. And not even for things they were not even praying for. They just wanted to survive. They could care less about winning the dumb war at this point. They're going, God has let us not die so we could go home with our tail between our legs. They dug some ditches, and God says, <laughs> guess what? I'm not only going to let you live, but you're going to take over the Moabites. You're going to take over their entire area. Just do what I want you to do. Just dig some ditches. I know you're dying, but I want to see, are you willing to go after me in faith? Are you willing to do something out of faith that I've called you to do? Are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to do it? And God comes through, and he answers prayer. Tonight, we got some time to pray. What is your ditch tonight that you need to dig? What is your ditch tonight that you need to dig? You know, maybe it's something financial you need to pray about. Maybe it's a healing that you need. Well, maybe, maybe it's just understanding who you are in Christ. You don't look at yourself as a perfect, spotless bride. You don't look at yourself as the Navy SEAL for the Lord. You don't see yourself as being able to do that. You see other people as that. You go, no, no, no. I, I'll sit back. They'll, I'll, I'll take on the little stuff. As long as I got people around me, I can take on the little stuff. But, you know, those guys are like the special elite. No, 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 no. That's not the way we need to look at it. We're all elite. God's in us. We're all his perfect spotless bride. God's in us. That's how he sees us. Slates wipe clean. As far as the east is from the west. We're his. We have his Holy Spirit. Come on, the same Holy Spirit that created the earth? I mean, I was in the four-year-old room. I was talking to the kids about how God knocked out Adam and how he made Adam from dirt and then he put Adam to sleep and took the rib out and just poof, he made Eve. And the kid's are like, oh, that's cool. That's the same Holy Spirit that's in us that God says, hey, I'm going to use you. I'm going to the Father. Do you believe it or not? What are you going to do? Dig some ditches. Maybe that's what you got to understand and realize. Maybe you need to come and pray and say, Lord, that's what I need tonight. You know, maybe you're here and you're going, dude, I... That's just not my heart, my attitude at all. I, the biggest thing you can ever step out in faith and do is come to Christ. That's the biggest thing that anybody could ever do. That's the biggest step of faith that anybody can ever make and just say at the end of the day, say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours. I love you. Take my life. I just want to live for you. That's the biggest step of faith that anybody can ever do, ever. That's the biggest, baddest miracle seeing someone's life change. That's awesome. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. I don't know. Guys, can we put some music on? And uh, they're going to play some music. We're going to just have the altars open for the next 15, 20 minutes. And just, I would encourage you to this. Spread out. Take some time and pray and just say, Lord, what do I need to do? What is it in my life that I need to dig so that I can step out in faith? And you can use me in the way that I know that I'm called to be used. Let me pray real quick. Lord, we just love you so much. Lord, I pray to her as we, as we seek you, as we pray about these things, Lord, I just pray that we will be able to dig a ditch tonight, that we will look at situations and say, Lord, move in power in my life. Help me have the faith and the confidence to go after you, to step out and do the things that I know that you have called me to do. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.